Okay. All right, so without any further ado, um, does anyone have any questions before we get started? Any of the announcements that we're making? All right, so you guys please give your uh, attention to Brother Tlahib, and uh, it's a very important presentation, guys, so uh, I'm sure he'll give you guys a chance right. to ask questions at the end, inshallah. So you guys pay attention and enjoy the presentation, inshallah. <laughs> I mean, may the law the most compassionate, the most merciful. Yeah, and may the peace and blessings be upon his last and final message of Muhammad. So this topic, guys, honestly, is very dear to me. It's not obviously this is Palestine. It's the uh, the fuel, the I guess you can say the motivation, um, the backbone of my activism, and a lot of things come from this. So when I talk today, I'm gonna get I have a lot of energy, and um, a lot of these things, a lot of these concepts. Uh, are really <coughs> integral to understanding why Muslims care about this issue around the world. Uh, I'm sure you guys seen in, in all the revolutions, if you watch any of the revolutions occurring in the world, look at the Egyptian revolution or the Tunisian revolution or the or the, even the Libyan revolution, and for some reason or the other, whether they're in Tahrir Square or they're in Sidi Bouzid or Benghazi or, or in Dara'a, they're all lifting Palestinian flags. So you, people think about this, like, wow, what are they doing? They're not in Palestine. Why are they lifting Palestinian flags? So this is a very um, important thing, and it really shows how deep this issue is for people around the world. And the, the, the symbol of resisting dictatorship is really comes back to um, their opportunity, the people's opportunity to fight for Palestine again. Because they feel that these dictators are keeping them from uh, obtaining the objective of freeing Palestine once again. So this is a very important matter. The core of the Islamic statements of Palestine is really summarized in one verse. And I'm going to talk about this verse a little bit. And this verse is in Surah Al-Isra, chapter uh, 17, verse number 1. Do you want to recite it for us? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanan ladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. Innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, glorified is he who took his slave Muhammad for a journey by night from Masjid al Haram in Mecca to Al Masjid al Aqsa in Jerusalem, whose surroundings we have blessed in order that we might show him our signs, our ayat. Verily, he is the all hearer, all seer. And this verse, honestly, it's, it, it puts it all into perspective for us. It puts it all into perspective for us. That, and I have here this book with me called The Jer Jerusalem and the Islamic Consciousness or Palestine Islamic Consciousness, written by Dr. Hatem Banzan of UC Berkeley. He spoke at UCI uh, last week. Um, and he writes basically that. This, this verse is so deep that believing in this, the Isra, believing in the ascendance of the Prophet from, from, uh, from the Haram al-Makki to, to Jerusalem is such a core belief in Islam that if you don't believe in it, it's almost like you're not, believing, it's not, almost like you're not Muslim. And there's, there's a paragraph here that says, One cannot understand Muslim veneration of Al-Quds or Jerusalem without comprehending the significance and overall meaning of this verse and the specific occasion for its revelation. The verse under consideration is so significant that scholars of Islamic theology consider a person who rejects the validity of the miracle contained therein to be outside Islam. That's how serious uh, and how deep this verse is, and how much explanation it provides for the content uh, of the message that we're trying to say here. So, I'm going to explain the Islam Maraj a little bit and just talk about it for just a second, just so that we can explain and give a little context, a little bit of background. But the Prophet, وسلم, after the death, and actually, there's some, there's some difference of opinion on when exactly it happened, um, because time was not recorded efficiently, but uh, it's definitely after uh, the situation in, in Ba'if, where the Prophet Sallallahu was, was brutally rejected by the people there, and he was feeling very, very down. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa sent this, this, this good hope to him. And that night took him from, uh, from Mecca on what's called the Burat. And it's kind of like, I don't know how to explain the Burat, it's like a horse with like, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a extremely unique type of animal, basically, that the Prophet uh, Muhammad got on top of, and it took him oh, in, a, in a one night, a journey in one night, to uh, Al Aqsa, to Jerusalem. Um, and basically, once that happened, it, it happened, it happened so quickly, and then it, he ascended to, to, to heaven to meet with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And this is where the, the whole discussion happens about how prayers were, were, uh, were basically uh, mandated at this time. Um, and there's, there's certain specific hadith to that. There's a lot that goes into this, by the way. There's a lot of uh, arguments, there's a lot of difference of opinion among the scholars about specific things that happen 
the Prophet Sallallahu led the prayer with all the Prophets in the Masjid Al-Aqsa, uh, which was built uh, after, after Masjid Al-Haram, 40 years a little bit after. I'm going to talk about that also as well. And whether or not he did it before or after, there's a lot of discussion about that. But the main point is that the Prophet Sallallahu went to Mecca, uh, Jerusalem from Mecca, and then from there ascended to heaven. And the Dome of the Rock is the, basically where the, the rock that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, came out of or, or left from Jerusalem to, uh, to, to, to heaven that, that still existed there in, in uh, Jerusalem. We'll talk about that. Linguistic connection. Al-Quds. Al-Quds means something holy, right? Al-Quddus. Uh, Al-Quddus. A lot of these words have the same root, which is Quds. Quddus. And Jerusalem is called Al-Quds, or the holy city in Arabic. It's very important to understand. Because of its nature, because of the verse that we saw previously, in which it stated that Masjid Haram, the Masjid Al-Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed. And the surroundings, by the way, scholars interpret that to be not just the, the area of Jerusalem, but all of Palestine. All of Palestine, and some scholars say even all of Bilad al-Sham, Syria, Lebanon, as well. They consider that as well the blessed land. And there's reasons for that. There's specific reasons for that and the historical reasons and also reasons that are going to be occurring in the future uh, in regards to Al-Mahshar, where all humanity will be gathered in this area uh, on the day of the So like I said, a lot of the Muqaddasa, the Holy Land, both found in the Quran and the Hadith. A lot of emphasis on this, in the Quran and the Hadith, especially in the Hadith. There's more Hadith than Quranic ayahs about the, the holiness of this city, the holiness of Al-Quds and Jerusalem. Quds, like I said, is, is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the holy, the all pure, free from any imperfection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, puts uh, very specifically. So, Al-Quds means pure and sanctified, like I said. And by using these words that are related, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala binds Palestine, the Holy Land, to Himself in a sense. He binds it to Himself in a sense, and that makes it very important. So as Muslims, uh, we must submit ourselves entirely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This means we must also realize that Palestine is indeed holy, and they were obligated to protect it, obligated to work for this cause. And this is really where the roots uh, of a lot of people's activism come from. Connection to our prophets. Okay? All, all of our prophets, all the prophets, whether uh, they were born, uh, either born or were either born or died in Palestine, or at least crossed through the Holy Land. So, for instance, uh, we have the prophets Ibrahim, uh, Lot, Abraham, Lot, David, Solomon, and Moses. May Allah be pleased with all of them, all lived uh, in the Holy Land. Moses obviously didn't go inside, uh, but died right outside. And he, his request, this actually emphasizes the, the holiness of this area, because Moses requested that before he died, according to Islamic teachings, that he would be buried as close as possible to, this, to Jerusalem, as close as possible to Palestine. Right? This is, this is, a, this is a well-known in Islamic theology. Um, Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac were born in Palestine, both of them. Um, Prophet Jesus, the Messiah, was born in Bethlehem. His mother Mary was from Nazareth, or Nasra. Um, there she was cared for by her uncle, Prophet Zechariah. In Islam, we believe that uh, Zechariah was the uncle of um, uh, Mary. And her cousin, which is the son of Zechariah, Zechariah is uh, John, Yahya who was born in Nazareth, uh, is called John the Baptist by, by the Christians. So this area is obviously very well connected with the prophets. Prophets have gone through here, have passed through here, have lived here, have died here, or, or were born there. Um, and this area actually still contains a lot of this. There's, I'm going to show you guys later on a cemetery uh, where some companions of the prophet have, have been buried, where some uh, people that fought for Palestine during the Crusades are buried still till this day. Some major scholars uh, are buried. Some major scholars come from Palestine as well. Uh, Imam Shafi, for example, comes from Gaza. Um, and he's, he's, he's responsible for one of the major schools of jurisprudence in Islam, Imam Shafi. Um, so, so this is an, also another important aspect to uh, the connection to our prophets. The Nigerian. So I talked about it a little bit. I'm going to give it a little bit more detail so you guys have an idea. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angel Jibreel um, took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, from Mecca to Al-Quds 
and back in one night. So obviously people didn't believe him when he came back and told them, hey guys, I went to Jerusalem, heaven came back in the same night. People were like kind of chiding him for that. And, and he had to explain himself. So this is known as the night journey or al-Isra. It's very uh, common. And the whole chapter 17 is named after this, al-Isra journey. Wa'an al-Quds, the Prophet sallallahu led all the prophets in prayer. Some say before ascending to heaven, some say after ascending to heaven. I like Imam Suyuti's position on this, where he says that he led the, led the prophets in prayer after he came, came back from heaven, because it makes more sense if you think about it. If you're going to meet God, you're most likely not going to waste time before meeting Him. You're going to go straight up and meet with Him and come back. Um, and, and he led the prayers. And because also the, he, when he was going up to heaven, he asked which, who is each prophet, right? He asked Jibreel, who, who's, which prophet is this? And so if he had met them beforehand, he wouldn't be asking them unless there's people say that there's too many prophets behind the praying. Yes, sir? Uh, not just that, but to add to the Imam Suyuti's position, Salah was not mandated until after he met with exactly. Allah. Exactly. So there would be no real purpose for the Salah before it was exactly. mandated. Exactly. So, I mean, also, we don't know how they prayed okay. as well. So that's a very good point as well. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led the prophets in prayer uh, at, the, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And by the way, Al-Aqsa, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Like I said, it was built by Abraham as well. Just like the, the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca was built, it was built by Abraham as well, approximately about 40 years after uh, it, the Mecca Masjid was built. Um, Al-Aqsa Mosque, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the farthest mosque, or the furthest mosque, is believed to be the second place of worship uh, built on earth. It is the third holiest site for Muslims after the Kaaba, um, the first qibla or direction for prayer um, faced Al-Quds. So for the first approximately 18 months um, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obtained the orders to prayer, Muslims were praying in the direction of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem for that long. And the reason for that obviously is because if you think about it, the Prophet, when he got the mandate for prayer, he was coming back to, to Palestine, to Jerusalem. So he assumed automatically that this would be um, the, the position to pray towards. Also, there were some idols uh, in, in, in the Kaaba as well, so that played a role in that. And then they later changed the direction towards Mecca. Al-Aqsa Mosque. Talk about Al-Aqsa. This is a nice picture of. By the way, there's a difference between this and an Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is not Al-Aqsa. This is the Dome of the Rock. Al-Aqsa, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like later. It's right next to it, by the way. It's like, uh, you can't really see here, it's too dark. Right. But it's in the same area. I think it's on the right right here. Yeah. You can kind of see the green minaret, the green dome. Al-Aqsa Mosque is smaller than that. Alright, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Let's talk about that a little bit. I had a uh, good fortune of going there in 1996, praying there. Um, and you see the, there's many gates to this area. So this whole area um, is called the Haram. And there has the Dome of the Rock on it, has an Aqsa Mosque on it, has the Dome of the Chain on it, has all these different things on it. And it's like this one area that's elevated platform that has all these mosques and, and areas on it. And you can go there and there's different gates that you can enter. Um, and there's often Israeli soldiers like walking around. And Friday, Friday prayers, they, they regulate big time because they don't want a, a, a basically a group of youth gathering in one area, they don't want too many people. So, because that could start something. Uh, the second intifada started at the Aqsa Mosque, at the doors of the Aqsa Mosque. Um, Israeli, uh, at that time he was, he was a military general, Ariel Sharon, walked in with a thousand Israeli soldiers. The Aqsa Mosque just walked in. And that, the guys were like, heck no. So, that started the second intifada, uh, the second uprising in 2000, right after uh, we had visited. So, at Aqsa Mosque, let's talk about that a little bit. The term al Masjid al-Aqsa does not mean just the building, um, which was built first by the Umayyad Caliph, the Umayyad, uh, Khalifa Abdul Malik bin Marwan in 692 uh, Comic Era. So 692, almost 700. Uh, that's, that's a couple decades after the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Any large mosque contains uh, within its boundaries other buildings, so like I said, which are part of it, such as schools, yards, fountains. And that's usually how they, that's how they term al Masjid. Uh, basically, Masjid has like now here in America we have that kind of where it's like more like a community center, not just a prayer hall. We have like a school, you have a, a multi purpose room, you have other things that relate to the community needs. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He blessed the land surrounding Masjid al Aqsa, including what is now known as Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, like I mentioned that earlier, and that is to be called Bilad al Sham. That means the entire area on the hill upon which sits Al Haram al Sharif. Is sacred and blessed for the Muslims. The mosque itself includes whatever buildings are on that hill. So the noble sanctuary contains many mosques. The two most important ones are Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock. This is the top of the Dome of the Aqsa. 
There's going to be another picture, I believe. This is the minaret of the Aqsa. Um, these are not pictures that I took. I just got these from the presentation. Um, so these are some of the things that we uh, we see when we see the Masjid al-Aqsa. It, it looks very old, and it's been rarely renovated. It's some of the some of the the caliphs that came after uh, Abdul Malik bin Mirwan paid special attention to the Aqsa Mosque. They took care of it. They made sure that it was renovated, uh, that that the that the structure was stable so that it could last for a long time. And many of these have different styles of of, uh, of structures, basically in one in one uh, building. Just because the time, as time went by, as the hundreds of years came, um, they they modified it and they fixed it. So the Masjid Al Aqsa, before the Muslims came. Uh, was basically just another area. It was like a small building. Um, and when the Khalifa Umar عنه, came to Jerusalem, I mentioned to you guys in, earlier in the, other, uh, in the other talk that I gave, how, how they came to Jerusalem, basically. Um, he entered Jerusalem. And the people of Jerusalem at the time, the Christian groups in Jerusalem at the time, uh, actually greeted Umar. They, opened, they, they, um, they welcomed him with open arms. And there was some issues about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at the time. And this became uh, a really key moment for Muslims because the, the Christians themselves assigned Muslims to hold the keys to the church. And they assigned a specific family. Um, and I'm going to talk about them, the Nusayba family. And actually, till this day, the same family holds the keys to the church. And they, they pass it down generation by generation. And they, they open, well, one guy goes, opens the church, or unlocks it, and one guy opens the door, and it's the same old tradition for hundreds of years, for centuries. Um, and they still, I'm going to show you guys a picture of that guy. Um, so, Umar found the holy site where Prophet Muhammad had led the, uh, the prophets in prayer, um, and they had, at that time it had turned into like a, basically like a garbage dump. It was like a, like a sanitation department, basically, at the time. And he basically started cleaning it, and then the, the companions joined him in cleaning uh, this, this area. And he was joined by his army and officers, like I said. And once the site was cleaned, he just laid down his cloak and he prayed there. And then people followed him in that prayer. Uh, this was the first Muslim prayer on that site since the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Um, after this first prayer, Umar ordered the Muslims to rebuild the mosque there at that point. Uh, so it had become like an area, they cleaned it, and they ordered it to be rebuilt. And there's also a Masjid Umar in Jerusalem. And this is where he was invited, um, Umar radiallahu anhu was invited to pray inside the church. Um, but he refused. And the reason why he refused was because if, if he thought if he prayed there, Muslims would get the wrong idea. That if you prayed there, then you have to make this into a mosque. So he decided to go across the street to preserve the church. Went across the street or like around the area. And he prayed in that area, and that's where they built the mosque. Uh, Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, which is another uh, venerated site in, in Jerusalem that still exists today, and it's right by the Church of the Holy Spirit, right by it. Like, till they, they exist, like it's in the courtyard basically of the church, um, and they make the call to prayer there. There's also, I think, the bells on the church that you can see. It still exists today, and it's really nice to go to this area to see it. I think you guys all have American citizenship, American passports. You can get in easily and go around to these areas. If you have a passing in ID, um, or if you have any other Jordanian, either, they won't they won't let you in. So, so uh, it's it's good to get a chance to look at these sites. So Khalifa Omar, like I said, uh, went to uh, the church. Today, the Mosque of Omar stands on the site where the Khalifa prayed. He found the holy site where Muslims, uh, where Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had led the prophets in prayer. I turned to garbage dump. I said that, and he basically built. Uh, the Masjid, Masjid Aqsa and the Masjid Omar built as well after that. Muslims hold the keys to the Christian Church of the Holy Spirit. This is the guy actually. His name is Abu Joda. And the Joda family and the Muslim family both hold the keys to the Christian Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they uh, basically maintain that, that, that honor of getting to hold the keys for that. And they still open it. They go in the morning and it passes down generation to generation. Um, he looks like a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the reason why I said this is actually several different things happen. So there are several different types of Christian churches uh, that claim ownership of the church because it's a really, really important church. Um, that's it's a it's a major place for uh, for pilgrimage during Christmas. Like it 
a lot of Christians from all over the world go to this area, um, and it's believed that Jesus was there, or died there, and there's, there's, there's different things, there's different opinions about what, what exactly is there. Um, but my dad went there this past summer, he told me it's, it's beautiful, um, the, way they, the way they designed it, the way they made it. Um, so the keys and oversight of the church uh, was given to two Muslim families. The Muslim Nusayba family have been custodians of the church since the time of Umar, and in 1192, after the, after the Crusades, Salah al-Din, um, who had liberated Jerusalem from the, from the Crusaders, gave the keys of the church to the Muslim Judah family. And twice each day, a Judah family member brings the key to the door, which is locked and unlocked by a member of the Nusayba family. This still happens today, hundreds of years later. It's crazy that this happens, and it's, it's insane because hundreds of years later, you still have people maintain that, that relationship and still caring about that, 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 uh, that tradition. Like, you know, when we become like, like our dads had some traditions that we don't keep, like, we're just like stupid, right? But these guys, they, they maintain it. They maintain it and they keep it um, and they care for it. And that's, that's the beauty of it. Same thing in Mecca with the Kaaba as well, the same family uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had given the keys to uh, for the Kaaba and they still maintain the same, hundreds of years later, centuries later, uh, they still maintain the keys of that. It's a very important thing. Um, Okay, so I'm going to get into other things, inshallah. So the ayat and hadith concerning Palestine, Jerusalem, and Al-Aqsa. And this is very important because, like I mentioned, there's a lot of hadith. There's an entire book of like hadith that are just specifically on Jerusalem, Sham, Al-Aqsa, and Palestine. Just, just specific. It's actually written by an Indian dude. He's a Gujarati. Uh, his name is Ismail Patel from England. He wrote a nice book of hadith about Jerusalem specifically. He's a crazy guy. He's an activist. He, uh, he was actually on the Mavi Marmara flotilla. He was shot at by the Israelis. Abu Darda narrated that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, A prayer in the sacred mosque in Mecca is worth 100,000 prayers. A prayer in my mosque in Medina is worth 1,000 prayers. And in Jerusalem is worth 500 prayers, more than any other mosque. And then Abu, Abu Dhar al Zafari asked the Prophet Muhammad, O oh, Messenger of Allah, which mosque was built first? He replied, the Masjid al Haram, which is in Mecca. And I asked, which was built next? He replied, the Masjid al Aqsa. I said, what was the period of construction between the two? He said, 40 years. So it's very specific. This hadith related to us very specific details of history um, and of uh, the content that we're talking about here. So it's very important to understand uh, that these, there's many more. I just, I just, these ones I chose because they were kind of cool. Um, and then there's some Quranic verses. And so to the Anbiya specifically, there's other verses and other uh, chapters, but these are the ones that I, li that I like to, to talk about uh, because it specifically talks about prophets and how they were related to this land. Yes, Fida. Um, what's the ruling for Salah and Qubba Is it the same? Inside of the Dome of the Rock? Like I don't know. I don't know. I think it has something to do with it, but Al-Aqsa is the only other place that, that Muslims can make a pilgrimage to. Besides Mecca and Medina. So like, that, that they're allowed to go to, yes? Is the pilgrimage mandatory? Like no, no, no. But if you can't go, that would be great. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like the sixth player of time to go to Hajj and like, relax it, no. <laughs> that would be tight. <laughs> Alright. Um, so in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعَنَ عُدُّ بِاللَّهِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ and we delivered him, Abraham, and Lot to the land which we had blessed for the world. Whoa, the world. What does that mean? What does that mean? So, it's very specific. It talks about this. Um, and when we talk about the world, like I mentioned earlier, this means because it's relating to the Day of Judgment. It's related to a Day of Judgment, where all of humanity will be gathered in this certain area. This area where the prophets uh, walked. And it's very important to... Uh, understand this as well because usually when you see the alameen, you know, Rabbil alameen, what does that mean specifically? There's, there's different interpretations of that by the different scholars, but this has a significance when it says Bil alameen to the world, not just this world, but the other world, the hereafter or the other dimensions um, that can be stated. Another verse, ten verses later, when he Sulaiman al Riha asifatan tajdi bi amrihi ila al ardi lati barakna fiha, wa kunna bi kulli shayin alameen. And to Solomon, we subjected the wind, blowing forcefully, proceeding by his command toward the land which we had blessed, and we are 
uh, ever of all things knowing. So the land of so, so Solomon as well, Solomon has special abilities, right? He can control the wind. Sort of like Storm of x right? She can control the wind. <laughs> so it's actually said in some of the hadith that in, in, uh, in the daytime, uh, when, it was, when, it was like, when it was cool, or when it was hot, Suleiman would, would use the wind to travel to like Afghanistan. And in the nighttime, when it was cooler, uh, it was, it, he would go back to Jerusalem over on the wind. And I think this is really like, important because sometimes you know, people say, well, why is Palestine just an important land? How come Muslims have problems all over the world? Why do we have to focus on Palestine? Um, but subhanAllah, like, this is uh, evidence that this is, a land is blessed. Not saying that Pakistan or Afghanistan is it, but this land is specifically, particularly uh, mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran uh, for that specific reason. Other important Islamic sites in Palestine, I'm going to show you guys some stuff that's pretty cool. Um, some things that, if you like art, uh, I would like you to draw for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Masjid Omar, uh, like we talked about, is near the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Then, Dome of the Chain, I'm going to show you guys the Dome of the Chain. It's probably like the, one of the most artistically made design things I've ever seen. Um, just the design, the way they put it together. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see the interior. Okay, it's the interior. Um, the intricate design is insane. Insane. If you see it up, up front, you realize like even in here, there's like little things that they did. Like, um, insane amount of detail. And Qubba is uh, is very important. So it's located at the center of the Aqsa Mosque compound. Some people say it is actually located at the center of the world. Um, and this is where like a lot of things happen. Uh, there's a history behind this with I don't, I didn't write it up here because I didn't want to bore you guys with all this detail, but uh, there's a lot of information on regards to how old this thing is. This thing is actually very old. Um, prayer rituals have been con uh, conducted here, other things have been conducted here. But basically, uh, the way it works <laughs> you don't want you to see it. Um, the way the way it is is that it's been built. Uh, it was built off the time of the of the, of the Aqsa Mosque um, and the and the Qubba al-Sakhra. And the design basically changes as you can see. The pillars have different types of like uh, like uh, faces, and that's because throughout time they updated it and they made it uh, they made it they modified it. Um, so the intricate detail is insane. Uh, wherever you go in Jerusalem, there's a lot of uh, beautiful architecture. And that's because, so like I said, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the caliphs put emphasis on making these areas beautiful. Um, especially because some people uh, pilgrimated. <laughs> My, uh, <laughs> made pilgrimage there. And, and, uh, and, they, and went there to, to really uh, worship. And, and also is because, like for example, the Dome of the Rock, when they built the Dome of the Rock, they intentionally built it to be insanely beautiful because they wanted it to stand out on the landscape. The landscape, everything else was gray and brown. They wanted to make something completely different. Well, they built it out of blue and gold. Uh, how, how, how crazy is that? Blue and gold, that, like, that catches your eye. The first thing, when you look at a picture of Jerusalem, you just notice, you notice the Dome of the Rock. It's because it's, that's how it is. Like, they, made, they made it that way. Um, so those are some of the things. Mamilla Cemetery. So this cemetery is very important. Why? Because so many people have been buried here. This is a cemetery for a long, long time, hundreds of years. And some of the crusade, some of the people that fought the crusades are buried here. Even before them, some companions, people say that some prophets are buried here. And um, the way they did it is that they buried people specifically. So there's like, I don't know if you guys can read this here, but this is a sheikh that died here. And there's another picture that I have of another sheikh. Um, here it says, here lies Sheikh Ahmed the Jani. Born in Jerusalem, 1459 AD, died 1561 AD. This is like a recent one too. Like those other ones are like insane. You can't even tell how old they are. Um, and the reason why I mentioned this cemetery is because of what Israel wants to do with it. So Israel wants to take this land and they want to build this. They want to build, guess what this is? Soccer stadium. A museum of tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> no joke, they actually want to build a museum of tolerance, a Simon Wiesenthal Center, the same one that we have in LA. You guys know? Have you guys been there? Yeah. There's an LA one. They want to build it here, on top of the cemetery. Um, and what they're doing is they're digging up bones and like if they, they even like covered some construction areas because they knew people were gonna get mad. So they they built like this 
this fence basically um, that they could cover all the, the, the specimens and stuff they're taking out of them. I mean, this is people that have been buried there for thousands of years, some people hundreds, shuch, big time scholars, doesn't matter. They're like pretty much digging them up and throwing away the, the remains to build the. They're throwing away, they're not really burying them. Oh, the no. no. They don't care. Is this recent? This is in the past four years, four or five years. Yeah. What so, the Museum of Tolerance, it's called. Yeah, in uh, Mamillo Cemetery. There, there was a campaign that was started here by CARE to stop the Simon Wiesenthal Center from building this there and all that, but I don't know how successful they've been um, in the past couple of years, unfortunately. And then there's another major beautiful site, which is called the Ibrahimi Mosque in Al Khalid. And this mosque uh, became famous or infamous in 1994, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But this mosque is uh, believed uh, to be where Ibrahim, uh, salam, Abraham, uh, is, is buried uh, and died. Um, it is believed that the Prophet Abraham uh, is buried here along with his wife Sada and the Prophets Isaac and Jacob and their wives as well. And uh, this is where a lot of people pray. It's a very, very old mosque, very big mosque. And actually, at one point, Israelis, like hardcore Zionist Jews, took over the mosque. And they prayed inside of it. And they, they sectioned off an area, Muslims could only pray on one side and then uh, the, the Jewish people could pray on the other side, and they actually took over uh, some of it. And there's a video they made uh, to mock the Muslims uh, a few, like a year, last year, where Israeli soldiers, while the adhan was being made, they cut off the adhan, and they played some song, and they started dancing in the middle of the street. Um, they're using the speakers that the adhan was being made out of. They started like playing some song. I don't know how they wired into it, and they played it. Um, and they did that, just to mock people, just, just to like mess with them. Uh, and they'll do these kind of things. In 1994, Baruch Goldstein, an American-born, uh, Brooklyn, New York, born in Brooklyn, New York, a uh, Zionist hardcore guy, his name is Baruch Goldstein. He uh, moved to Israel because he felt like he had a duty, and he served in the military there as a doctor. He had a very nice automatic weapon, walked into the mosque, and just started shooting people. He killed 29 and wounded hundreds. Um, and probably was one of the biggest attacks on, 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 on people that were praying because they were, they were not holding weapons, they were not fighting, they just shot them. Um, eventually, uh, other people that were praying beat him and killed him. Uh, but, but he ended up killing this many people. Uh, and this man was venerated in Israel. Like, Israeli society loved him. I mean, when he got killed, he considered him a martyr. You know, he did it for Israel, he did it for the, for the Torah, he said. Um, this was uh, one major attack, really that, that made the Oslo 1993 peace process look like crap. It was like, man, you guys wanted peace for this. Um, so, so this is one major attack on the Ibrahim Mosque where they attack specifically a mosque. Uh, not only this attack on the mosque, but in Gaza recently in 2008, 2009, when I went there, I saw they had attacked several mosques. Um, and they had des destroyed them, demolished them completely. Very beautiful mosque with nice domes and nice minaret, uh, where people were praying. And they destroyed them completely. So they, they used that as well as, as a technique, as a mechanism to uh, to, uh, to basically piss off the Muslims. 